before we get to to Gödel, in the 20s, David Hilbert put forward a, a very influential project in the, in the mathematics. For decades, the, the, there had been a worry about the consistency of these systems and inconsistency that uh, popped up and, and uh, where we didn't expect them, uh, even in very mm -hmm. simple uh, ideas uh, such as Frege's uh, uh, comprehension uh, uh, principle and and uh, but Hilbert actually gave it a, a, a very clear statement could, could you could you give us a a sense of Hilbert's uh, project and uh, what view of uh, the foundations of mathematics emerges out of it and how it differs from logicism <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, um, logicism fails for the kinds of reasons we've talked about. Okay, um, so the paradoxes gave logicians or mathematical logicians a kind of nervous breakdown. I mean, this was really traumatic um, because you know, after all, Frege's axioms look as though they're a priori true. Um, if it hadn't been for paradoxes like Russell's and its kin, we wouldn't have had a problem with them. And they do appear kind of logical, that's okay. But, you know, they lead to paradox, so they lead to contradiction. So, as I say, this was kind of nervous breakdown. Um, and people like Hilbert, wanted the assurance this was never going to happen again. So how do you do this? Well, this was Hilbert's idea. Um, and it's meant to apply to mathematics in general. Um, but most of Hilbert's work was just on arithmetic. And the means and the results uh, you can understand just by thinking of arithmetic. So, so let's talk about arithmetic. Um, Hilbert's idea was this. Okay, look, let's, cons let's have an axiom system for arithmetic. And he didn't have to invent that. Such things were already known. They were pretty much known before Frege anyway. First one I think was produced by Dedekind. So you've got this axiom system for arithmetic. And you can go about proving theorems and so on. Um, what you want is some kind of proof that this axiom system is consistent. In other words, that once you start to sort of churn out the theorems, you're never going to reach contradiction. So you need a consistency proof. All right. Any consistency proof is going to be a proof. It's going to therefore use arguments. Now, one of the issues you're facing is that you can't necessarily trust your arguments. You know, that's the shock that Frege suffered. Um, so it's not good enough giving any old kind of argument. You need ones you can really trust. Okay. So Hilbert said that the arguments in your consistency proof have got to be finite tree. Now, I don't think he ever actually defined finite tree, but they've got to be pretty simple and the kind of thing that have a kind of a legitimate a priori warrant. He does give examples of finite tree arguments. Um, so when he pushes his philosophy of mathematics, it goes like this. Um, some of um, the axioms or the inferences we use 
Um, just concern finite things. One plus one is two, uh, one plus one is two, and two plus two is four, etc., etc. Um, all, all those are fine. Okay. Things go wrong when you have to worry about infinite totalities. Of course, the, the collection of natural numbers is infinite. So you've got to worry about not just these finite statements, but statements about what happens for all numbers. So he said, those you can't trust. Um, they're sort of ideal in the sense that uh, we use them, um, but we use them to prove the kind of finite stuff. It makes life simpler. But um, in principle, you could get by without them. So this notion of an ideal, um, one way you can get at it is from geometry. So take Euclidean geometry. Um, there's a way of formulating Euclidean geometry, which is it's got all the usual stuff that you can think of, but there's also a point at infinity. This is a rather strange object. Um, and if you do that, you can kind of simplify a lot of things. You know, parallel lines are going to meet, but they admit at this point of infinity, so it simplifies things. So um, in, in this formulation of Euclidean geometry, the point of infinity is an ideal element. You don't need it, but it helps. Um, and in his philosophy of mathematics, Hilbert thought of the statements which quantify over all numbers as kind of ideal in this way. Um, Appealing to these things, you does, can... does this include standard um, formulas or theorems like Goldbach's uh, conjecture or yes, Fermat's absolutely. theorem? Yes, Any, anything that quantifies over all numbers is going to be like this. Um, does that mean that questions of their truth does not arise meaningfully? Um, that's a good question. I'm just trying to remember what Hilbert said about truth. Um, I can't remember anywhere where he discusses this, which is probably my ignorance. Um, but the notion of truth was under a bit of a cloud uh, at this time, um, you know, partly because metaphysics was coming into ill repute because of people like the positivists. Um, so it may well be that he was quite happy just to talk about provability rather than truth. Um, so in, in the case of these finitary statements, you have these sort of very simple proofs. So you can talk about truth there if you like. These ideal things, well, um, who knows? They're just things which help you prove they're the honest to God stuff. Um, so if, if there's more to the story about truth than that in a little bit, I mean, I'd have to go check, sorry. Well, formalism is, means a number of things. Um, some people, especially later on, people like Curry, take formalism just to be that mathematics is the, the science of playing with formal systems when the symbols have no interpretations. This was not Hilbert's view. Um, things like two and three and so on certainly have meanings. You know, you can represent them in terms of matchsticks, you know, two matchsticks, three matchsticks. So he certainly did not think that mathematics was about playing with formal systems. Um, the axioms, the finitary axioms, have a very concrete meaning. It's almost in terms of matchsticks. Right? Um, and we can verify their truth or verify their acceptability just by concrete manipulations of matchsticks, if you like. Um, the infinitary statements, the ones that range, have quantified that range over all numbers, um, are a different matter. You, you cannot have this kind of concrete verification of them. Um, so you have to sort of remove those to some kind of ideal realm. Um, so the honest to God stuff happens at this sort of finitary level where you've got these very concrete verifications. Talking about the, the, this uh, project to prove the consistency of various uh, systems, uh, what, uh, how far had we gone 
uh, before Gado uh, came out with uh, with his theorems. I mean, how successful was this attempt to to prove the consistency of systems? It had gone quite a long way. Um, so I'm not sure when Hilbert's project starts. It's certainly up and running by the early 1920s. Um, and so Hilbert and his students like Ackerman and Bernays wanted a consistency proof and it had to be finite free. That means that you had to have some way of dealing with, you had to get, had to handle the quantifiers somehow in a finite free way. And they developed a number of techniques for doing this. There's a bit of machinery which is sometimes called Hilbert's Epsilon system. And what it is, is um, essentially a, a definite description. It's a, it's a description operator, but an indefinite description operator. So it's not the thing which is such and such, it's a thing which is such and such. So there's this whole technology of Hilbert's Epsilon system. And they, um, Hilbert and his students applied this to do lots of cool things with the proof theory of arithmetic. So uh, they never succeeded, but they, they, they seemed to be making progress. Um, and then Gödel published his results in, what, what was it, what, 31, I think? Yeah, it must be 31. Um, and that sort of blew a hole in the project. Which takes us to Gödel, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, before we get there, could you, could you tell us uh, what completeness is going back to uh, the properties of uh, formal systems. Consistency is a property of a formal system and, and the other relevant uh, notion uh, is the notion of completeness of a formal yeah. system. Can you tell us? What okay, well, completeness, the word completeness is used in different ways in logic. Um, but in the sense that's relevant here, a complete theory is one that proves everything that you think should be provable. Okay. So, um, if you, you're just sticking to arithmetic, um, there's something called the standard interpretation. That is, you know, the word zero means what you think it means. Uh, the word add, X plus Y means what you think it means, and so on. That's very vague, but it'll do. Um, so the standard interpretation of your formal language is one where the symbols get those meanings. Um, and there's going to be a set of things, a set of formulas, which are true in this interpretation. You know, if you frig around with the meanings, you know, if you interpret zero as 37, then of course bizarre things are going to happen. But if you stick with the proper meanings, uh, then you're going to get a bunch of things which are true in this interpretation, the standard interpretation. And the completeness of the arithmetic is simply the claim that everything that's true in this interpretation is provable. So you can prove everything that's true, if you want to put it that way, i.e. true in the standard interpretation. Doesn't that uh, require that we know in advance of which sentences are true? I mean, once it comes to uh, uh, sentences that are unknown, uh, such as uh, Fermat's theorem back then, or um, uh, Goldbach's conjecture, things that we don't know if they're true or not, how do we know if uh, those should come out as uh, true or false? Well, because uh, you can have a sort of second level argument that everything provable is, everything true is provable, uh, or that uh, there are some things which are true which are not provable. Um, so it doesn't require you to decide every statement of arithmetic um, because the proofs are kind of a, a level one removed, a meta level, if you like, which is in some ways how the Gödel proof works. Um, and uh, before proving uh, his famous uh, incompleteness results, um, Gödel uh, proved the completeness result. And yes. Can you tell us uh, what it amounts to, and <coughs> in general, how far uh, uh, the the project of uh, showing that some systems were complete had gone uh, before yeah, yeah. Gödel's theorem? Okay. So look, um, Gödel's completeness theorem uses the word completeness in a different sense. Um, 
it concerns not arithmetic, but it concerns logic. So if you take an axiom system for logic, um, then you can prove a bunch of theorems. And if you give a semantics for this language, think in terms of truth tables, okay. Um, you can use the truth tables to define a notion of validity. Yeah. Uh, true in every line of the truth table, or however you want to cash it out. Um, and it's not difficult to show that uh, this, the standard axiomatizations of logic, which were around in the 1920s, are sound in the sense that everything you can prove is indeed valid in the truth table semantics. Um, that leaves the other half of the problem. Is everything that's valid in the semantics provable? Uh, and that's also a meaning of the word complete. And um, if you just stick to the prop classical propositional calculus, it was known that the axiom systems for the classical propositional calculus are complete in this sense. Um, once you throw quantifiers in and move to first order logic, Again, the axiom systems were known to be sound, um, but their completeness, whether they were complete, was not known. And that's what Gödel proved in the earlier result. What he showed was that if you took um, the standard axiomatization of first order logic, then everything that's valid in the semantics of first order logic is indeed provable. So this is, this is a different sense of completeness. Um, there were some bits of mathematics which were known to be complete in the other sense. Um, for example, Tarski proved that if you take certain formulations of Euclidean geometry, this is complete. Um, such that, I mean, Euclidean geometry is another thing which has a kind of an intended interpretation, you know, points, lines in Euclidean space. Um, and Tarski showed that this was complete. This 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 axiomatization was incomplete. When did he show this? Um, I'd have to go check the dates. Um, it's either twenties or thirties, so it may have predated Gödel's result, or it may be a bit later. But certainly there are bits of mathematics which are known to be complete. But in the end, Hilbert's problem was about the whole of mathematics, not just bits of it, um, and he chose to work with arithmetic because it's a very significant part of mathematics and many of the problems that arise arise with arithmetic in the first place.